continue our sermon series this morning titled, This is Church. And today we're going to be looking at pastors, deacons, and the ministry of the saints. We're going to finish this sermon series next week. I think next week is, um, for many, probably going to be one of the most educational, and I would even argue most important messages of this sermon series, because we're going to deal with next week this topic of judgment in the church. Should there be any judgment in the church? Should there be no judgment in the church? What happens when we have clear um, sinful actions in the church? Who's responsible for dealing with those? What should you do if you know something about a brother or sister that needs addressed? We're going to look at uh, this topic that I believe uh, the devil's turned upside down on its head in the church. We're terrified to hold anybody accountable. We're terrified of of being considered judgmental, and uh, we don't know what proper judgment is or isn't. And so next week, when we finish this sermon series, all of next week is going to be about that. This morning, we're going to look at pastors, deacons, and the ministry of the saints. If you would stand as we honor together the reading of God's Word this morning. Beginning in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, we're going to read through the first part of verse 14. And he, that is God, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro. We're going to stop there. Let us pray. Father, this morning we come to your word, and God, we've gathered to worship you. Uh, We acknowledge that above all we need you. I pray, God, this morning that as your word goes forth, that Um, God, our hearts would be open to it. Help us to receive your word. Help us to believe your word. I pray for me, God, help me to rightly teach and preach the word of God this morning. Let it be clear. And God, we pray if there be anybody who showed up today, God, they're not right with you. Lord, they're not born again. They're not saved. God, we pray today would be that day, Lord, that they would turn to you in faith. Father, we love you, we thank you, we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I got my PowerPoint note wrong, it says part two, it's part three. Yes, I write these things, I don't purchase them from anybody else and preach other people's materials, and occasionally I use the same um, template and forget to change part two to part three. This morning, we're going to be studying pastors, deacons, and the ministry of the saints. I hope by the time we're done, there will be some clarity on what pastors and deacons are, um, what their roles are, what you should be able to expect from your pastors and deacons, what your pastors and deacons should be able to expect from you. Um, The first thing I want to do before kind of getting to some of the functions of your pastors and deacons, I want to clarify, I think, something that's really important, and, and that is that The word overseer, shepherd, pastor, elder are used interchangeably in the New Testament. Now, a lot of times in our culture, and and really the same is true even here at the well, um, we use those terms to define different categories of pastors um, or deacons or elders. But in the New Testament sense, what's important is to understand today we are studying those who are responsible by God and to God for overseeing the church. I'm just going to show you a quick few passages um, to see that these words are kind of used interchangeably. Look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Uh, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Paul is addressing the elders here. He uses the term flock, and so we have this concept of them being shepherds, tenderly caring for the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And so now we see the term overseers here. To care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. 
And then 1 Peter chapter 5, we see some of these terms also used interchangeably. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Look at this term elders here. We see that the elders are under the chief shepherd. Let me back up. We see the word exercising oversight at the top there. And then when we go back to verse 1, we see elders again in the term shepherd. This morning, I don't want to be repetitive. In fact, I'm going to skip through a couple of... uh, We see the same concept here in Ephesians chapter 4 with shepherds, uh, a word that can be termed as pastors. We see the same thing in Titus verses 1 through 7 and 9. Here they are called overseers. I don't want to be too repetitive this morning, but it's important that we clarify that in the Bible, the shepherd, the elder, um, the overseer, it's the same office. I'm going to tell you why this is important. A lot of times what will happen is is we'll see, as we're going to see, that um, as people of God, we are to be subject to or submit to the leaders that God's placed over us. And what will happen is a lot of times is somebody will get sideways with maybe a pastor, um, one of their spiritual leaders, and then they will choose to not show that person the respect that is really due uh, to an overseer, and they'll, they'll say terms like, well, he's just a pastor, he's not an elder. Um, he's, he's just uh, a shepherd, he's not an overseer. And, and what happens is, is we start to take some of these terms and kind of twist them to our own liking when we decide that we just don't want to submit to our spiritual authorities. And I just, I'm not going to spend much more time on it this morning, I'm just going to tell you it's wrong. You know, the reason that we have different terms is because often these terms help um, paint a picture of their responsibilities. So a shepherd tenderly cares for the flock. He also has a staff that he beats the sheep with if they won't do what he tells them where they're supposed to go. So that's what a shepherd does. I'm just saying, that's what a shepherd does. Also, we have the term overseer. And this generally deals with obvious oversight and the responsibility for having a a knowledge of what's happening with the people and helping kind of manage that, right? And then we have the context uh, or or the idea of an elder. An elder doesn't necessarily have to be old. I would be considered an elder here at this church, and I'm not necessarily old, 39 years old. And so it's getting there. My hair tells a different story, or lack thereof. But an elder is a term that generally um, comes along with the idea of those who walk in spiritual wisdom and have the responsibility of making wise decisions that affect everybody else. And so you're going to find that these terms are used interchangeably, kind of depending on what's trying to be communicated. But you need to know this morning they are the same thing. And so when we are told to respect our elders, that means we are to respect our pastors. When we are told that, um, you know, that we need to um, yield to, to those who quote unquote rule over us, that um, that applies not to overseers, it applies to shepherds, it applies to elders. It is really three different terms used to describe the same office. So this morning I want to ask the question then, what are the role of elders? What are the role of your pastors? What should you be able to expect from your spiritual leaders? And biblically, we're going to try to answer this looking at the New Testament. Uh, The first thing we're going to see this morning is that elders lead the church. Elders lead the church. Over the next 10 or 15 minutes, we're going to look at a lot of Scripture together. So I hope you don't get tired reading, but I think it's important that you see this. This is a concept that's really found throughout all the New Testament. And so uh, we're going to look, first of all, at elders leading the church. 1 Timothy 5.17 Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. 
So we see that elders rule or um, have authority over, if you will. Um, I want you to notice the word, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. It's an important phrase because it teaches us that you don't necessarily have to be a preacher or teacher, per se, to be an elder. Now, we will find later that an overseer, who is an elder, same thing, needs to be able to teach. But that does not necessarily mean in this, the public setting. So I, I, I constantly um, argue that I believe most teaching and impactful communication happens in smaller groups. It happens one-on-one. And so to be an elder doesn't necessarily mean you've got to be able to get up and preach to the congregation or, or you know, teach to large groups of people. There are people that just get nervous in front of folks. They just don't, they just don't like it. But if you get them down and you sit at the table, they're able to open up the Word of God. They're able to rightly divide it, clearly teach it, uh, correct where correction needs to be made, admonish where admonition needs to be made. And so an elder does need to know the Word of God, need to be able to rightly handle the Word of God, uh, need to have the authority to teach the Word of God, but doesn't necessarily have to be a preacher that gets up and preaches to the masses. He leads the church. We see the same idea here in Titus chapter 1. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Here we see in the first part of this passage that a leader is a leader. In other words, he goes first. Right? He shows the way. He lives above reproach. He's not arrogant. He's not quick tempered. He's, he's hospitable. He's upright. He's self controlled. He's disciplined. He's someone that you could actually look as an example and follow. And then we see that he needs to be able to give instruction, sound doctrine, and at times. The, the nasty part of rebuking, it's not a fun part of the job, but sometimes it's there. You've got to rebuke those who contradict the Word of God. Then we see in 1 Peter chapter 5, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you younger, be subject to the elders. Again, I just want to focus on that term, being examples to the flock. So elders are to lead the church. We lead by what we live and by what we teach. You should expect spiritual elders to be people that you can watch. And like Paul said, follow me. Look at my example and do what I do. True spiritual elders should be able to say this to the entire flock. I remember the concept, um, probably early 20s uh, as a Christian, I heard somebody um, make the statement of, you know, don't follow me, follow Jesus. Well, if you're not following Jesus and you're not living right for God, that is a great thing to say. Don't follow you. Follow Jesus. But at some point in time, we've got to grow up into maturity and recognize we've got to be the example of what does that look like? What what does that mean? I mean, if I'm telling you to do it, I should be able to show you how I do it, right? That doesn't mean we do it perfectly. It doesn't mean we always get it right. But we should live lives where people are able to look at us as elders and say, this is what spiritual living looks like. We are leaders not only in the way we live, but also in what we teach. Which brings me to my second point. The second function of your elders is to teach and preach the word. Teach and preach the word. 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 4, Paul says to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. 
For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Elders are to teach and preach the word. This is, you know, we've mentioned it already a couple times in the sermon series, but this is incredibly important that we understand this is our primary goal, spiritual leaders. We're not teaching and preaching our own concepts, our own ideas, our own desires, our own wants, our own visions, but we are to teach and preach the Word of God. And, and as elders of the church, elders are responsible for making sure that that happens on a regular basis to the church. You guys should be able to show up any time that we gather for corporate worship and be taught hear the preached or taught word of God. It's one of the responsibilities given to the elders. Number three, elders protect the church from false teachers. Are you starting to see the theme here that the primary heartbeat of the elders is making sure that the people of God hear the word correctly, know the word correctly, are taught the word correctly, and are protected from incorrect teaching. This is the primary heartbeat that is handed to the the elders and is their responsibility to make sure happens at the church. Look at this uh, from Acts chapter 20, the idea of protecting the church from false teachers. First of all, in verse 17, um, Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. I just have that there so that you see this is the elders. And then we see they are addressed in verses 28 through 31. To the elders, here's what Paul said, pay careful attention to yourselves. Notice that first of all, the elders need to pay attention to themselves. Before an elder, pastor, spiritual leader, authority figure... Is be, has any business helping others, he first has to be able to manage his own life. Pay attention to yourself and then to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I'm going to look at the protection aspect of this passage in just a minute, but I want... I want, if if you have been tasked in any capacity with leadership, um, overseeing, um, if God, just just look at what the statement here. He's made us overseers to care for the church of God. Not your church. It's not my church. It's don't belong to us, folks. There's a sense of holiness that comes with this statement. I've probably read this passage somewhere around 15 times in the last few days getting ready for this message. And it has, it has really helped restore in my life a sense of awe and wonder for what God has called us to do. This is not our church. I'm the lead pastor here. This is not my church. It does not belong to me. It has never belonged to me, and it will never belong to me. It's God's. And that should bring a sense of holiness and fear to those whom God has tasked to oversee it. But Paul doesn't just leave it there. That would be enough. Then he says, which he obtained with his own blood. That's a humbling and holy statement. Obtained or purchased it. The cost was his own blood. Now, those of you that have been tasked with oversight and leading, you understand that the church of God that you're handling, he purchased with his own blood. We better handle it carefully. Now, the concept of protecting the church. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering... That for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. Here we see the concept of elders protecting the church from false teachers. It's one of our responsibilities. It's one of our responsibilities as elders is to be teaching accurately, preaching accurately, and protecting the church from false doctrine. You know, 
God has, um, has elders kind of set aside as a specific group of spiritual leaders to clearly teach the Word of God to God's people. That said, all of us should be in the Word of God. The Word of God isn't just something to be handled by the elders. It's not something that's only to be handled by the pastors. All of you should be in it. And I think if, an, if a church is doing its job well, if an elders are doing their job correctly, the people of the church should be so familiar with what the Bible teaches that when false teaching comes up, it's like red flags start to go up. There's a, there's, and, and false teaching doesn't always have to be um, just, you know, awful. I hear a lot of false teaching on the radio today. Um, and, and specifically, let me just be clear about what I'm referencing. Specifically, I'm talking about stations like K-Love. And it's not intentional. People aren't trying to, to, to... It's normally pundits making a phrase. And I want to be cautious. I mean, none of us know what it's like to have to speak on radio you know, five days a week for four or five hours straight and always have to try to come up with something to say and sound loving. You'd probably make mistakes too, and so would I. But I hear things where I'm just like, that's not true. (laughs) It's just not true. It doesn't work that way. You can't live any way you want to live and everything be right. If your world's falling apart because you're living in sin, don't just trust God it's all going to get better. You need to repent of your sins and do it God's way if you expect God to bless your life. But, but it's like people are afraid to say these things because they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And we hear them enough that if we're not careful and we don't have elders properly teaching us the Word of God and we're not in the Word of God, we hear these things and false teaching creeps in and then we make poor choices. We live according to false truth. Thinking Well, I can do what I want to do, live how I want to live, act how I want to act, and somehow God's going to bless me. God's not going to bless you if you just do it your way. You've got to do it God's way. That's one small example of where it's very important to have elders that are teaching the Word of God clearly, regularly, so that when false teaching comes up, you're able to identify it. And it is necessary at times that we just call it out. It's necessary at times that we say, hey, this is kind of a constant theme that's coming through our culture right now. You just need to know it's not biblical. Don't embrace it. Don't go that way. Elders teach and preach the word. They protect the church from false teachers. Number four, elders visit the sick and pray for those in need. This is a biblical responsibility of your elders. Let's look at two passages. First from James chapter 5. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. This is James chapter 5. A couple of things I want to point out about the passage. We have the idea here of anyone being sick calling for the elders of the church. Very important to know that not only the elders can pray. And that there's not like a second God that we go to that the rest of God's people don't, right? There's one God, there's one throne, and we can all come boldly before the throne of grace in our time of need. And so the Bible's not teaching that, you know, only the elders can pray and that only the elders have some capacity to break through to God. What's, hack, what's happening here is the general concept of, it's, it's almost like insinuated that you've already prayed. You've already sought the face of God. You may have already had a handful of your friends gather and pray for you. And why, we don't know, but God has not moved in a way that you're able to identify yet. And so there's this, this concept of let's call for the elders And let's gather around together and let's pray about this thing. It's one of the responsibilities that we have is to be praying for you people in your special times of need. We have the idea of anointing with oil. It's something we do here at this church. It's something that you probably, if if you've been here any length of time, you've seen us anoint with oil. It's something that's kind of foreign in 2019 in the American church. But there's, we do it 
because of what we just read. There's nothing magical about the oil. Um, why do we do it? We do it because the Bible says to do it, but let me go beyond that. The anointing of the oil is really just a representation of the Holy Spirit. A lot of times in the Old Testament when God would call a king or anoint a king for something, it would require that the prophet anointed him with oil. It was just kind of this picture of God's covering, God's anointing. Um, And so it's a picture of the Holy Spirit, if you will. There's nothing magical about it. I'll give you an example that might make more sense in our common era of time. Baptism. There's nothing magical about baptism. There's nothing magical about the water. In fact, what makes baptism significant is what it represents, right? It's a representation of a person's life, their old self going down, their new self coming up, going down dirty in their sins, coming up cleansed by the water of the Word, um, being identified with Christ who was buried and then resurrected from the grave. It's, It's all that baptism represents that makes it special, but it's, there's nothing magical about the event itself. If just the act of baptism somehow magically made people saved, would you agree with me the most uh, important thing we could do is go drain our bank account, set up a baptism tank on the corner, and pay 50 bucks to every person that would let us baptize them? I mean, if it really did work that way. But we all know it doesn't, right? There has to be this element of the heart. And so we understand this concept of what baptism symbolizes. The same is true with the anointing of the oil. And it is something that you will see us do here and continue to do here. But this is one of the functions of the elders is to visit the sick, to pray for those in need. And then we find in Acts chapter 6 and verse 4, um, the apostles made this statement. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. I'm personally convinced when we look at this passage and we look at um, what was going on at this time in Acts, that the prayer spoken of here is similar to the prayer spoken of in James chapter 5. In other words, it wasn't personal prayer. They already had, they, I, I know they had personal prayer but I believe they were committed to praying for people. They would go to multitudes of places and people would bring all sorts of people to them and they'd pray for this need and they'd pray for that need and they'd pray for that need. And what they were in essence saying in in Acts chapter 6 was, this is where in Acts chapter 6 is when we see the institution of deacons. There was some ladies that were widows that felt like one group of widows was getting more attention than the other group of widows. And so they brought the issue to the pastors, the apostles, And the apostles said, you know what, we're at a stage now where the church has got large enough. We really can't stay committed and focused to these things like we need to. And so why don't you pick out from among yourself six men that are um, of good reputation, spiritual men, and let them handle this. And that's where we see the deacons born in Acts chapter 6. And this was their response to that was, as for us... We're going to devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. I believe those are both public things. The ministry of the word, teaching to the word in groups, and taking time to pray for people. Either way, one of our responsibilities of elders is to visit the sick and pray for those in need. And then finally, elders judge on doctrinal issues. In Acts chapter 15, let's look at it together. Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And so some teaching came in. Some Old Testament um, mentality in the Old Testament before Jesus, before the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, before the coming of the new covenant. In order to be long uh, to the Jewish nation, if you were male, you had to have the mark of circumcision. And so some people who kind of came from that school of thought, their grandpa and their granddaddy and their great-granddaddy, that's the school of thought they came through. Well, now they're in the church and they're saying, hey, wait a second. No, we believe in Jesus, but you can't be saved without going through the Old Testament mark of circumcision. And now all the church is talking about it and everybody's arguing about it. And we see that what happened was 
the apostles and elders were gathered together to consider this matter. We see they had the authority to make a declaration on the matter. And they do, and the declaration is, it's not necessary. You don't have to go through the Old Testament mark of circumcision to be saved. And so we see one of the responsibilities is elders judge in doctrinal issues. In biblical terminology, let's break down what we've discovered so far. Elders are shepherds. We have the responsibility for caring for the flock, overseeing the flock. We are overseers. We have a responsibility for having a general knowledge of what's happening with the church of God, the functions of the church of God. And, And I would even argue overseeing brings along this idea of putting together the systems necessary for the church to operate correctly. It's exactly what happened in Acts chapter 6. Church had gone too, too large for the apostles to handle everything, and so they put a system in place and instituted deacons to help with the need. I want to address now what aren't our responsibilities. What should you not expect from your elders? Number one, we are not the source of news for all things related to the church. I remember when the church was like 150, 200 people, and I started to cross that threshold where I, could, I just couldn't know everything that was going on, and, and then I began to panic. Like it was, and, and I panicked, not because I really wanted to know, but I felt like I was responsible to know. Because, right, that's what a shepherd should know. Shepherd's supposed to know everybody by name, right? The sheep knows his, the shepherd knows his sheep by name. I really doubt old Apostle Peter knew all 3,000 people by name that got saved on day one in Acts chapter 2. We have to be careful not to take analogies and press them too far. I got to where I didn't know, you know, all the details of how my youth pastor chose his curriculum and how our children's department decided how much money they spent on snacks. And, and so occasionally you might ask, you know, how's this, you know, how did that happen or what's going on here? And I wouldn't know. I had to learn that, first of all, there's no biblical evidence I was supposed to know in the first place. I don't have to know everything that goes on. And I'm telling you, as the church has grown, I have learned I don't want to know. I would rather get the right people in place. And here's what I need to know. I need to know that i got the right people in place. I know their character. I know that they've they've showed a sincere, consistent love for God. I know that they they take what they do seriously. They are in line with with where we're headed as a church. And at some point in time, you got to just turn that over and say, you do your thing. I don't care how you do it. I don't need to know how you do it. If you got questions, I'm here. But do your thing. It's important that you understand that your elders, your pastors, your deacons, it's not our job to know everything that happens here at the church. It's our job to lead lives that are examples to you. It's our job to properly teach the Word of God and in your moments of true spiritual need, be there to help you along the way. What else are we not supposed to do? Something that's not a responsibility of your elders. It's not a responsibility to be at all of your personal life events. This is something also when I was younger. I mean, I just, I felt like it was the responsibility of the pastor to be at everybody's life event. Imagine if I had to be at everybody's birthday. But there are people probably here under the sound of my voice, your feelings have been hurt because I did not come to your birthday party. Let it sink in. You see, when you have unrealistic expectations of your elders, you find that you uh, end up hurt and wounded expecting things that God never told you to expect from them. You'll also find if you happen to fit in that role as as a spiritual leader, as an elder... If you don't understand biblical expectations, you'll take on responsibility and carry it and feel like you're failing all the time. I've been there, I know. I wish somebody would have sat down and had this sermon preached to me when we very first started the church. 
Because I remember before I ever let that go, feeling like somehow, some way, you've got to be at everybody's thing, everybody's event, everybody's personal life. You know, Jesus had 12 disciples, folks. 12. And three. Three that were close. It's not the job of your elders, your pastors, your deacons to be deeply involved in your private life, your personal life, at all of your life events. Ultimately, God-ordained elders are meant to be there to help you in times of true spiritual conflict. Teach you the scriptures. Give you biblical direction. Pray for you when you need prayer. And live lives that are examples that you can follow. We are to be leaders. One of the things that's really important that you understand about your spiritual leaders is that there will come a time when you just have to trust them. You're just going to have to trust them. I don't care if it's here, if you don't like us and you think that we're bad spiritual elders and you quit and run to some other church. You have to understand the principle I'm telling you. There will come a time you will be forced with the choice to simply trust your spiritual leaders. You know, they can't tell you everything. They can't let you in into all the big picture they actually see and know in the decisions they have to make. And you just got to trust them. And you're going to have to trust that there's a reason that God's put them in there and there's a reason that, uh, for God's order, and I'm just going to have to trust. I used the analogy earlier of a coach in our 9 a.m. service that, you know, if you ever had a coach that tried to tell you to do something a certain way and you just thought you knew better, you just thought, no, that's, that's not going to work. My coach don't know what he's talking about. Most of the time in most scenarios... Your coach has played a whole lot longer than you have and probably coached half as long as you've been alive. And you'll find if you'll trust your coach and just give it a shot, the light bulb goes off and you find out, oh, there's a reason he's the coach and I'm not. It's not a whole lot different with parenting. You realize with parenting, you can't tell your kids everything. You just can't. There's certain things that little ears just don't need to hear. Sometimes you might be have to make difficult uh, decisions as parents and, and there's conflict involved with people and other maybe family members and, and it's not good and healthy necessarily that you air everything out for your children to know all the details. It's just not best all the time. And you know what's going to have to happen in that moment? Your kids are just going to have to trust you. That you're the parents and you're in this place of being able to make the authoritative decisions. They don't need to know all the details. They're just going to have to trust. That same dynamic does exist at times with your spiritual elders. Where you're not going to trust everything. It's not going to totally make sense. You're not going to know why they do what they do. But you're going to have to trust God's design with it. That I don't know all the details. I can't figure it all out. But I'm going to trust God's design. I tell people this all the time. It's not me that you have to trust. Just trust God's design with his church. Trust that if I get it wrong, God will handle it. Trust that if our elders make the wrong decision, God will handle it. And trust that when something's kind of working in a way that doesn't really make sense to you, just trust you probably don't actually know all the details and, and that there's probably more to the story than what you know. And you just have to trust God's design for His church. So there will come a time you have to trust your spiritual leaders. Now, concerning elders um, and kind of, you know, how does this work practically here at the well? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I am going to answer it because a lot of people don't know. Uh, We sort of have here some categories that you're not going to find in the New Testament per se, such as ordained pastors, licensed pastors, ordained deacons, acting deacons, directors of ministries, teachers and volunteers. Um, we, we have these roles kind of specified to help us understand when we're communicating, and they're not clearly specified um, in the New Testament, but I'm going to explain why we do what we do. First of all, pastors. We have ordained pastors, licensed pastors. The concept comes from Uh, Paul in the book of 1 Timothy saying that an overseer, that would be a bishop or an elder, pastor, shepherd, is not to be a novice. And the concept there is that there needs to be this time of growing up into that role. 
And so how do, you, how do you do that? How do you determine when somebody's in that role? You know, do you wait to become an ordained minister and then start acting like one? Or do you function as one in some capacity and then become ordained? And so what we do here at the well, we have this period of time when someone believes God has called them into the realm of pastoring, that they, they tell us that, they clarify that, they announce that, if you will, and, and then we find ways to try to work them into ministry. Try to find out kind of what is their niche, what do they do. When you talk about pastoring, what is on your heart, and, and what does that look like? And then we find ways to try to implement that, and then there comes a time when we would license that person and licensing basically says to everybody, hey, we recognize God's call on this person's life, but we're going to give them a period of time to kind of live that out in front of us and live that out in front of you. And, and, um, and the final process of that's ordination when the elders, if you will, say, look, we've examined, we know this person's character, we know this person's ministry, and we approve full-heartedly of, of, of what we see and we ordain this person as an official pastor, as an ordained pastor of the well. That person would be considered an elder, if you will. Our deacons, um, really not a whole lot different in, the, in that process. We don't use the word license. We'd use the word acting. Someone would become an acting de- deacon at first, function in the capacity of serving as a deacon. And then over a period of time, after the person, number one, make sure they want to do it. I've actually had... I don't know, a good portion of deacons that are like, I want to do this. And then they get in and find out, I don't want to do this. And that's fine. Sometimes you don't know until you get in and give it a try. Um, and, but those that get in and it's like, this is, this is what they're meant to do. There's this period of time where we allow them to serve, allow the body of Christ to get familiar with them, allow them to build the relationships with our pastors, the elders of our church, and then we move towards ordination with our deacons. A director here at the church is somebody that functions in a pretty significant capacity but doesn't have the responsibility of overseeing the whole church. That's what the elder's responsibility is. There's no realm of influence that a biblical elder is not responsible for overseeing concerning the church. Our directors, for example, let's say director of children's ministry, would have a specific role where we ask that person to oversee that specific role within the body of Christ and function under the elders, under the authority, under the leadership of the elders. Then we have our teachers and our volunteers. And the last thing that I want to deal with this morning concerning elders before finishing with the ministry of the saints is the biblical truth that overseers, elders, are men. Look what... 1 Timothy 2.12 says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Now, if you go on to read that passage, you actually find that there's some explanation, and the heartbeat of the explanation is because God's design doesn't permit it, and because when you try to do it the other way around, it brings chaos. But this is a very clear statement. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority authority over a man. There is no confusion that the elder must exercise authority over the entire church. Therefore, it's not possible for a woman to function in that role. There are none, zero, elders who are women in the New Testament. Now, I want to clarify something that I think is really important. Number one, women can do ministry. And God does anoint and appoint women for the work of ministry. This concept of elders is this very small pocket in the church where God says these people are are tasked with the responsibility of overseeing the entire thing, the authority of dealing with discipline and correction, the authority of making sure the word is properly taught. And that one tiny role, he says, I reserve for men. But Christianity is a woman's religion in the sense that we see Jesus sitting with women. And the rest of his peers wouldn't. 
whether it was the woman at the well and all of his disciples are like, what's going on with this? This isn't how, you know, spiritual teachers normally treat women. Whether it was the fact that at the tomb, the first people to come in and see that Jesus was, had been resurrected from the dead, it was women. The first people to go out and literally, if you will, preach and proclaim the message that Christ is risen from the dead were women doing it to the apostles. Jesus had women who ministered to him alongside uh, and traveled with him in ministry. And, and I've wrote a book on this. I'm not plugging my own book here, but I have a literal book, a published book. It's titled, Let Her Speak, and it deals with women in the church. So don't misunderstand me this morning when I tell you that eldership is reserved for men. Don't misunderstand me to say that I'm saying women can't be used in ministry. Nothing could be further from the truth. But in the realm of having authority over the entire church, authority over that position is reserved for men. Now this morning, I want to close with a sincere focus on really the important part of what we started off with in Ephesians 4. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, look at these words, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunningness, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow up so that it builds itself up in love. That's a really long sentence, and I encourage you to go home and read it again and meditate on it. Here's what it says in a nutshell. Your elders are meant to equip you for the work so that all of us grow up into maturity and ultimately together as one body bring about unity of the Spirit and the fullness of Christ. Look at that term. He gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. There we have, there's, there's a kind of group of elders. He gave you the elders to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's ultimately what true spiritual elders will do. They're not people who lord power over you. They're not people who demand a bunch of, you know, they're not, they're not tyrants looking for servants. They're not kings looking for subjects. They are leaders who lead the way and ultimately are doing so to equip saints for the work of ministry. The overseer's ministry is equipping the rest of God's people for their ministry. That is the role of your elders. Next, notice that the majority of ministry is done by the saints. The majority of ministry is done by the saints. In the last several decades, church has kind of taken on, and maybe even centuries, church has taken on this mindset that, you know, ministry, if you're going to be in ministry, right, that's a pastor, maybe an evangelist, singer maybe, teacher, we got a small group list of like, you know, eight things, and that's ministry, and everybody else just comes to church and tries to cheer on the ministers. It's just not New Testament Christianity, folks. Our job is to equip you for ministry and send you out for ministry. The reality is, once you leave those doors, that is the mission field. And a good church with true spiritual elders will be challenging you into ministry and equipping you with the tools and knowledge necessary to take the word of God into your world and evangelize the people in your life. Finally, from the same passage, we see this concept that to accomplish the will of God, the saints need their elders, and the elders need the saints. We are one body. What good is a bunch of elders that don't have anyone following? Nobody to, to, to help with. Nobody to help reach the community with. Our church has grown beyond my capacity. I, there's 24 hours in my day, just like yours. 
Seven days in my week, just like your week. 365 days in my year, just like your year. There's only so much one human being can do. Everything else that we do going forward, anything that we add, any more work that is done is going to require more people doing the work. That's the bottom line. God has given me a vision for the Well Worship Center. I could nail down where I think will be five years, 10 years, 15 years from now, the things that I think that we'll accomplish. God's given me some vision for it, but here's the truth. The vision's not actually for me. It's for you. Because I can't do it. I can only do so much. My job is to serve as an elder who equips the saints for the work of ministry. And so I understand just as much as you need me and other spiritual elders in your life, I need you. We need you. We are one body. And when we understand that we need each other and we trust God's design and we're willing to operate by God's design, that's when we see God's work get accomplished. Amen? Chris, if you'll come, I've got three questions that I want to leave you with today as you think about the spiritual leaders in your life. Number one, do you see any evidence that our current Christian culture has turned away from respecting true spiritual leaders or submitting to pastoral authority. Number two, can you think of anything this morning in your life that you need pastoral authority or leading over? Do a heart check. How willing are you this morning to submit to, to be led by, the biblically identified elders whom God has placed as overseers in your life? 